Alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah alone. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Blessing and peace upon the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, this is Universal Quran, where we study the Quran, the scripture of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad more than 1,400 years ago. And we examine it in light of its tafsir, its interpretation and explanation according to the methodology of the early generations and scholars of Islamic studies in the Islamic Ummah. We're studying the 30th section, the final section of the Holy Quran, and today we're going to be examining Surah Al-Baruj, the uh, 85th chapter of the Quran. Fairuz is going to recite for us in Arabic so that we can uh, study the meaning from the original language as it was revealed exactly to the Prophet Muhammad so that Muslims will keep in mind, re memorize in their heart and study in the original language and not change and reinterpret it into a foreign, a foreign language, into uh, uh, concepts which were not the concepts which were understood at that time. It's very dangerous when people read something, for example, they read a, an English translation of the Qur'an, what they do, they, they read an English word, which is an approximate representation of what the Qur'an says, and then they make assumptions and start interpreting the meaning based on their understanding of English, and it's totally different than the actual the intended meaning as it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. So we should go back and study the meanings in the original. And so Fairuz uh, is from Singapore, and he's an excellent reciter. He's going to recite for us in Arabic. And Bilal, who is from Canada, uh, is going to recite for us uh, or, or read for us from the English interpretation of the meanings of the Quran. So I would ask Fayruz to please read from 1 through 4. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. والسماء ذات البروج واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود بلا. I seek refuge with Allah from shaitan the outcast in the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful, by the heaven holding the big stars, and by the promised day, and by the witnessing day, and by the witness day, cursed were the people of the ditch. Thank you. Um, once again, in these verses, Allah starts out by calling into witness, making an oath based on certain aspects of His creation, and I would like to repeat once again for those who have not heard previously that we are not allowed to make oaths by any other than Allah because it is an act of worship. If I swear an oath by the name of God, by the name of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is an act of worship. And so we don't swear oaths by the Kaaba, by the Holy House of Mecca, or by any created thing, not even by the Prophet himself. But we swear oaths only in the name of Allah. Uh, but Allah calls into witness with His power, because He has power of e over everything in this creation, it's in His power to call as witness anything He wants of His creation. And so He is calling into witness of the truth of the Holy Qur'an, uh, the heaven, and as it said in this translation, uh, these big stars, it's talking about the constellations, the the apparent um, assemblies of stars in the heavens that we see. So we see different groupings of stars, and those are called constellations. And by the promised day, al-yawm al-ma'ud, which is the day of judgment which has been promised 
to us in the Quran. And in fact, on the tongue of every prophet of Allah, every prophet has warned his people of the coming end of the world to prepare themselves for judgment day before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third verse, uh, by the witnessing day and the witness day. First of all, the first one, shahid, means a witness. Uh, the prophets were sent as witnesses over their people. And so the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the witness over all of us. And the Muslims bear witness over all the people whom they know. The Muslims bear witness that they have conveyed the message. The Prophet conveyed the message to us, and we convey the message to uh, our neighbors and to all the people of the world, uh, God willing, that we will have the power to do that. Uh, but there's a particular uh, tafsir of this, which is indicated in this translation. And Abu Huraira, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, uh, narrated this, as did many other companions, that the shahid, or the witness, is the day uh, of Friday, the day of Jum'ah. And that is the holiest day, the best day of the week, the day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the, the, the human being, our father Adam, our ancestor. And it is the day that Adam sinned and was cast out of paradise, and Allah taught him the words of repentance, and Adam repented. So Friday is the day of gathering in the Muslim community. Uh, a lot of non-Muslims think that Friday is the Muslim Sabbath day. And Sabbath, or Sabbath, means a rest, a day of rest. And on Saturday, that was the day that Jews were commanded to rest and not perform any work. But Muslims gather together in the masjid and observe that day, listen to the khutbah and pray. But they uh, are allowed to work uh, normally after the sermon and prayer is over on Friday. They go back to work. And the next day, the, the witness day, al-yawm al-mashhud, is the day of Arafat. The day of Arafat is the great day in Islam when all the pilgrims gather together uh, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Arafat, outside of the city of Mecca, during the annual pilgrimage. And they are standing there as if preparing for the Day of Judgment, taking account of themselves and repenting of their sins so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. And so that is the uh, great holy day. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathered them together in his final pilgrimage and made a very important speech to them on that day. Uh, the Day of Arafat is... Uh, a holy day in Islam and it is the day that is uh, witnessed or the witness day it is a preparation of the day of judgment which will also come on Friday when the trumpets are blown and the day of judgment begins is also on the day of Jummah so that is a very important day uh, also in Islam uh, so uh, we'll go on a lot uh, he began in the fourth verse cursed were a certain group of people a lot is saying they are cursed the people of the ditch or Ukhdud, what is that? And there's a big story behind that. Uh, historically, uh, Ibn Abbas and other scholars of tafsir or the interpretation of the Holy Quran have explained uh, who were these people of the ditch. This happened in the pre-Islamic time in Yemen, in the southern part of the Arab Peninsula. There was a kingdom called the Hemyarite Kingdom. And there was a king over that people who was called Dun Nawas. And they were actually Jewish rulers who were appointed by the Persian Empire. And what would happen at that time is that the Persians controlled Yemen, and then the Christian Ethiopians invaded Yemen and Christianized the area. And uh, over and over again, they fought over the southern part of Arabia and exchanged hands more than one time between the Persians, who believed in two gods, a good god and an evil god, and the Christians of Ethiopia who Christianized that area before Islam. Anyway, before, uh, during his time, many people believed in the message of Al-Masih, Christ, the original message of Christ that was taught uh, by Christ, uh, the gospel that was revealed to him by Allah, which all Muslims believe in, uh, not the later distorted message which has come to represent Christianity to many people. But they believed and uh, their king uh, tried to force them to renounce their belief and a large ditch or trench, maybe a trench is a better English translation, was dug. Uh, huge trees were cut and burnt 
and people were given the choice of being cast into that fire or renouncing their faith. And some people renounced their faith, but most of them refused, and they were cast alive and burnt alive for their religion. So Allah is uh, talking about these people. And we'll go on to the, some more verses about what happened there, verses 5 through 7. النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود Fire supplied abundantly with fuel when they sat by it and they witnessed what they are doing against the, the believers. Yeah, so Allah is talking about the fire being uh, fed with abundant fuel with, with trees that were cut and that the people witnessed what they were doing. They saw very well that they were murdering innocent people only for their religion. Let's go on to 8 and 9. وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ They had nothing against them except that they believed in Allah, the Almighty, word, worthy of all praise, who to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and Allah is witness over all things. There's a story related in the books of Tafsir, and in the books of Hadith, uh, in great detail, and there are different varieties of this story. These stories are what are called the Israeliyat. They were narrated by Christians and Jews who embraced Islam in the time of the Prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, gave them permission to narrate these stories. And so even though these stories often are narrated in the name of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, you have to know they have their origin in the legends and stories of the tribe of Israel and those people who believed among them from, uh, who believed in Christ. And this story is called the story of the boy and the king, that a boy was brought to be trained by the king's sorcerer in evil magic and wickedness, but he went under the influence of a monk, a pious monk, uh, a Christian monk. Uh, just to make the story a little bit shorter, uh, one day a huge beast blocked the road, and he said, uh, if... If uh, the monk's uh, practices are more beloved to Allah than the practices of the sorcerer, then, uh, then kill this beast. And he threw a rock at the beast, and the beast died. And after that, he was able to, granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the power to cure people of diseases, and many people believed in him. Anyway, to make the story a little bit short, he was eventually killed by the king, but in witnessing his death, people embraced his religion and then the king, Bunawas, uh, slaughtered the followers of the religion of the boy and the monk who originally believed in the pure teachings of Christ, who is one of the prophets of Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers, and we're called upon to believe them in sacrifice. And sometimes we're even called to sacrifice our own lives. Sometimes people suffer, are tortured, are, are, are killed in the name of, 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 of their religion. And so we're called upon sometimes even to sacrifice our lives. And so thank, thank, thank God that we have things very easy and this does not happen to us. And inshallah, Allah will protect us and all Muslims. Uh, we'll go to a break now. We'll be back. We'll finish the rest of this surah. <laughs> trying to get together, but all their efforts were in vain because of ignoring or turning away from this great foundation. We see many people coming to the way of truth, following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but later on, they get off track. What is the reason behind that? Unity is a result, it's not a cover-up. We have to be united from inside. And Allah made this clear in the Quran when He said, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولَ
Welcome back to chapter uh, to Universal Quran. We're studying chapter 85, Al Baruj. We are talking about the story of the boy and the king who lived in Yemen before the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They lived in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, and people embraced the teachings of Christ, uh, Jesus, the Messiah, who was sent by Allah subhanahu wa taala, one of the prophets of Islam. He taught it tawhid the worship of God alone, and he taught people that he was God's servant and messenger, but he was a human being, and he asked people to worship their creator who sent him, not to worship him. So their religion was pure monotheism or tawhid, the Islamic concept of one God. But those people suffered. They were burnt in a ditch, as it says in these verses, only for the sake of their religion and for no other reason. They did nothing evil. Muslims have to be aware that sometimes they will suffer, sometimes they will be hurt or harmed for the sake of their religion, and they have to be patient uh, and forbearing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us, uh, if we can read verse 11, you'll see the promise that comes to the believers who suffer for their faith. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتَنُوا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا فَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمَ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ الْحَرِيقُ Yeah, um, I'm sorry, that, that was verse 10, you're right. Uh, can you read that, Bilal? Verily those who put into trial the believing men and believing women, and then do not turn to repentance, will have the torment of hell and they will have the punishment of, of the blazing fire. So those people who spend their lives tormenting people for, because of their religion, there are different ways. Not everybody murders people and burns them alive. Of course, that's happened even in our own time where Muslims and people of other religions are simply killed and slaughtered. Uh, and they're not guilty of any crime other than having a religion different than the religion of other people. But those people who test and trial, believing men and believing women by ridiculing them, by making things difficult for them, uh, firing them from their jobs, for example, uh, Muslim women who wear Islamic dress, or Muslim men who wear the Islam, for example, growing a beard, uh, sometimes are fired from their jobs. They suffer in a lot of ways. What happens? People who treat people in that way, they have a chance, which is toba, which is repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if they've done evil and wickedness, if they realize their error and they're sorry and they turn sincerely back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will forgive them for what they do. But if they do not and they die in that state, trying and testing the believers with evil and wickedness, then they have the torment of hellfire and will be punished in the burning fire. Just as these people uh, punished, uh, the unbeliever, uh, punished the believers by burning them in fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause them to burn forever in the fires of hell. Uh, for that reason, uh, it's not permitted in Islam that you should torture or kill somebody by fire. But you have to slaughter, as the Prophet ﷺ said, or uh, execute in the best and most efficient way, in a humanitarian way, not in a way of torturing and harming people, such as burning them with fire. Uh, the next verse, verse 11, talks about what will happen to the believers who are patient and endure uh, this suffering and torment. And that is, I'm sorry, that's verse 11. Yes, sir. Thanks for uh, reading the correct verse. Inna al-lazina amanu wa amilu s-salihati lahum jannatu tajri min tahtiha al-anhar thalika al-fawzu al-kabir Verily, those who believe and do righteous good deeds, for them will be gardens under which rivers flow. That is the great success. So, there are two different measures of success. We have a measure of what we believe is success in this world. That everybody likes me, I get lots of money, uh, all the things that every human being desires. That's what we consider success. But people who sometimes give up success in this life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is another success. But this success, the success in heaven, in Jannah, in gardens, as Allah is giving example, gardens beneath which rivers flow, meaning extremely lush, well-watered vegetation, the most beautiful kind of garden you can imagine. 
the gardens in Jannah or in paradise are far, far uh, above anything we could imagine in this world. But that is the true success. Why? Because it is eternal. Everything we have in this world, if we lived, if any of us lived, for example, 100 years, you know, we, you can't even hope that you would live that long. But if we did, we'd consider that we were very successful living to be 100 years old. Uh, and if we were 100 years old and also successful, uh, that would be a great thing, that we had good health and our minds were strong and we were wealthy and happy. But in eternity, that's infinity. It goes on and on. What's 100 years compared to infinity? It's as if it were nothing, zero. There's a, the same relationship between zero and infinity as there is between 100 and infinity. And so the success that lasts forever and ever is not comparable at all to any kind of worldly success. And so if you are forced to choose between worldly success and success in the hereafter, you should choose what is infinite, what is lasting forever. Uh, can you read verses 12 through 16? إن بطش ربك لشديد إنه هو يبدئ ويعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد Thank you. Verily, the grip of your Lord is severe. Verily, he it is who brings and repeats. Sorry. Verily, he it is who begins and repeats. And he is oft forgiving, full of love. Owner of the throne, the glorious. He does what he intends or wills. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning. When it says the grip, or when he seizes some, somebody, when he seizes people in their sin and destroys them, it is severe and painful. So butch means with force, with violence the seizures of those people who are the enemies of Allah, those people who torment the Muslims and punish them and murder them. They are Allah's enemies. And they're warned of painful punishments that could befall them in this life. But even if they get away with their crimes in this world, they will be seized by the angels at the time of death in a great force, in, a, a, in great pain, and they will experience from the time of their death forever and ever eternal punishment for their evil and wickedness and disobedience of Allah. But Allah is all oft forgiving, all forgiving of those people who commit sins, but then regret them and they realize their error and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is al-wudud, full of love. Full of love. His love is something which is available to everybody, but you have to choose. You choose by doing those things which are beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then you can experience the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not something that you can just be a wicked and evil person, and you say, oh, God loves me, and God is just going to overlook what I do. That would not be justice, because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves everybody, uh, and then an evil person uh, kills and tortures an innocent child, for example, doesn't his love for that child mean that the evil person must suffer torment and punishment uh, for his crime? Otherwise, that would not be love and mercy of Allah. He is the Lord of the throne, the owner of the throne, he is glorious beyond all description, beyond any attributes of the human being or any characteristics of anything in this world. For he does whatever he wills or intends. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, he need only say be, and it is created by his power. So we'll go on and read verses 17 through 18. Fir'aun <laughs> wa thamud. Thank you. Has the story reached you of the hosts of Pharaoh and Thamud? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing us another example of a tyrant, a king, and a ruler who exalted himself, aggrandized himself above Allah's commandments and tormented innocent people only and solely for the sake of their religion. Pharaoh was the name of all the different kings of Egypt but this is particularly talking about one Pharaoh. Now all the Pharaohs considered themselves to be sons of the sun god, and so they were divine, and they were, every word was obeyed. They had power over life and death over their people. And so when the tribe of Israel were enslaved by them, were treated very badly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the prophet Moses 
to uh, go to Pharaoh and ask him to allow his people to go so they could worship their Lord. And so Pharaoh also uh, slayed the children of Beni Israel, uh, the tribe of Israel, and tried to prevent them from escaping. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, drowned him and his forces in the water of the Red Sea. The mood also uh, is another story of people who lived in Arabia. This is not found in the Bible and it's not known to many people in the West. But their ruins are found today in Madai and Saleh. Their prophet Saleh came to them, uh, warned them to worship Allah and to repent from the evil and wickedness they were doing. And so they slayed the she-camel of Saleh, who was a sign sent to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah destroyed them, and you can see the ruins of their civilization. So you can travel in the world and see the ruins of these people who have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's read the last four verses of this surah. بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ Thank you. Can you read that? Nay, the disbelievers persist in denying and Allah encompasses them from behind. Nay, this is a glorious Qur- Qur'an inscribed in, the preserved pe- uh, inscribed in the preserved tablet. Thank you. So, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling the signs of the heavens and the earth, the signs in the, all the environment in the world around us, uh, of His power and His might to bring us to judgment, and He's showing us the actual physical punishments that have befallen uh, tyrants and people who have opposed him in the past, the ruins of their civilization, they were destroyed, yet they persist in denying, persist in rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message. But this message is preserved in the glorious Quran, which is noble and exalted and unique in all of its facets. It's noble, and when something is noble, it is special and different than everything else. The Quran is itself a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which cannot be duplicated. And it is preserved in a tablet in heaven that was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon which are written its words and the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all we have for today. Jazakum Allahu khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدَةً وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابَ صُنْعَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَفْعَلُونَ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون